All right, all right, all right. It is noon in the east. It is 9 a.m. in the west. And where the Olympics are, it is sometime next week. This is Lunch with Lincoln. Hey everyone, good Monday. I am Reed Galen, co-founder of the Lincoln Project and your host for Lunch with Lincoln today. My guest today is Stephen Smith, professor of political science at Yale. Uh, Stephen, I want to thank you for joining me. My pleasure to be here with you, Reed. Uh, so Stephen, you've got a book uh, that came out last year called Reclaiming Patriotism in an Age of Extremism. So I want to get to the book in a second, but um, I'm glad to have you on today because of what happened I, here in Utah last week, which was um, the Republican National Committee in its winter meeting um, voted to censure um, Representatives Liz Cheney of Wyoming and Adam Kinzinger of Illinois. That in and of itself, not particularly surprising, considering they've been apostates uh, pretty much since January 6th of last year. Uh, what was, I think, interesting and, and it seemed to be a wake up call for many folks in, in sort of the Politico media set uh, was in the in the document it read uh, for, um, you know, basically conducting a witch hunt in the form of the January 6th committee uh, because, you know, against what they call legitimate political discourse. Now, this expression of legitimate political discourse in the context of January 6th led everyone to believe that Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel, Ronna Romney McDaniel, we should say, uh, and the 168 members of the Republican National Committee, who are all locally elected by activists in their states, are now okay with political violence, which is what January 6th was. So in your experience, in your history, in your writing, what does that tell us about the, the Republican National Committee, the Republican Party writ large, uh, and how you see uh, people like Liz Cheney? Uh, thanks for asking, Reed. Uh, let me just say a word before getting into that. Let me just say a word about the book, which, as you mentioned, came out just about a year ago. This time it came out, I think, in February of last year. So it was written entirely before January sixth and the events that we associate with the election and the post-election period. The, these were obviously not had not occurred at, at this time. And things have, in a way, sort of devolved uh, since since write, writing the book. Uh, the book was written as a response. We can get into this to kind of two two different extremes that have uh, sort of captured American politics. Uh, kind of right wing nationalism of the kind that we saw on the sixth and else and elsewhere, and and also from the left kind of the kind of multiculturalist cosmopolitanism, which which has become that sort of official ideology of the left. Mm -hmm. The book was an attempt to capture or to reclaim patriotism from, from both, both of these extremes. Uh, the thing that is perhaps striking about the uh, description of what happened on the 6th, this legitimate political discourse, is it seems to uh, have expanded or extended the concept of discourse uh, to sorts of things which are completely non-discursive, non we might say, acts of violence. This becomes, dis this how, how or under what description does this count as, quote, dis discourse? Mm -hmm. um, no, uh, discourse is sort of the opposite of this. Discourse is conversation. Discourse is a, is a, is disagreement. People disagreeing or, you know, seeking for agreement or disagreeing through language, through, through the use of, of reasoned speech, articulate speech. It's not a mob uh, organized to disrupt, if not overturn, an election. So I think it shows a complete uh, you know, degradation of the concept of discourse to call what went on a year ago under that description. Um, so this past weekend in the New York Times, uh, you, were, you were quoted as talking about Liz Cheney about having this sort of honorable fealty to the Constitution. Um, and that, you know, there are a lot of folks 
Um, look, I, I worked for Dick Cheney a million years ago as an advanced man, right, as junior a squirrel as you can get in politics. Um, I've known Congresswoman Cheney pretty much since that time. Uh, there are a lot of Republicans who obviously see her as some, you know, again, I, I hate to maybe make things worse by using the word traitor, but that's probably how they see her. There's a lot of Democrats who probably believe that she is the scion of Darth Vader, as they like to call him, but has at least in this moment lined up, you know, with the angels. Um, so how do you see her position in the context of, of, of patriotism? Well, I mean, I do not, did not know, I, frankly, I have to admit, I did not know much about Liz Cheney other than, you know, being the daughter of the vice president, former vice president, and being congressman from Wyoming before this. I should say, you know, her, um, her public pos positioning on Trump, the Trump administration, and on January 6th in particular, I think is really an example of a kind of profile and courage. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing to, very, very rare. You know, I, you, you mentioned the word apostate. I've, I've always had a sort of a soft spot for contrarians, apostates of different kinds. I, I'm, something, <laughs> I'm, something a, I'm something of a contrarian on the Yale campus, for example. Mm. Uh, one of the things I have to admit that I enjoyed, one of the things I admit before the book was published when, uh, that I quite enjoyed when colleagues at Yale would ask me what I was writing on, what, what I was doing. I said, oh, I'm writing a book defending patriotism, looking at the faces of the response the response to that, often one of incredulity, shock, right. occasion, horror at, at the thought. So uh, I'm not sure if Congresswoman Cheney cares for the term terms like, I'm sure she doesn't, terms like apostate, because I think she's not an apostate. She's qu quite the opposite, doing uh, standing up and defending what was a kind of traditional understanding of republic of republicanism or right. I wouldn't even say republican I would say just American patriotism right being a patriot I think that's uh, you know and today it's it's odd we have to say it's a very honorable what used to be normal is now has to be said an, an honorable an unusual and an honorable action so you know I want to I want to switch to your book because um, first of all there's you you mentioned, you mentioned um, Lincoln a fair amount, but I before you get to that, I wanna I wanna give you a similar story. So my wife and I uh, went to see Fran Lebowitz here mm -hmm. in Salt Lake City two weekends ago, and um, obviously Fran Lebowitz a social commentator, lifelong New Yorker, very wry sense of humor, very funny. She was taking questions, and yeah, folks need to remember that. Although Utah is a is a broadly very conservative state, Salt Lake City itself, the city of Salt Lake City, is a, is sort of what Rick Perry used to call the blueberry in the tomato soup. It is a very concentrated, progressive area, and I don't even remember what the question was, but she got asked something, and the answer was, "Well, look, I like George Washington, and I know I'm not supposed to like George Washington." And she sort of goes through the litany of original sin. She goes, "But I like him. He's the father of the country, and I like George Washington." And, and Stephen, it sort of sucked the air out of this very progressive crowd because they didn't know what to do about it because they see Fran Lebowitz as sort of a, an icon of, of liberalism, but she's not an icon of progressivism, right. which I think are two different things. And I think it's, and so when you, when you talk about your book about, you know, there's, there's the, you know, the extremist right, the radical right, but there is a reaction to that, which, which is, Ha, you know, can form an extremism of its own, which is sort of the negative polarity, I guess I'd call it, for lack of a better way to put it, that pushes folks on the on the far left equally far away. Oh, oh, absolutely. Well, my first response to that is, God bless Fran Lebowitz. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I didn't. That was great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I one of the things, um, and it, it's hard to know who 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 was responding to whom because they're both responding to each other right uh that the woke left uh which you, you know I, I mean i teach at yale uh sure. wokeness wokeness is more in my uh 
you know, orbit system here that I have to push against than, say, if I lived in Utah, where, you know, the do as you say, with the exception of Salt Lake, the dominant movement tends to be from the right. We all kind of have to push back from, you know, our immediate environment. The hardest thing to do is to call out the people on your own side and say, this is, this is wrong, you've gone too far. Right. And part of my book was, was you know, while I, I tried to be kind of even handed in, in the way I, I, I uh, treated both the left and the right, uh, part of it, a lot of it was, was pushing back on the left because, you know, I'm in a university, universities tend left, as, as we all know. Sure. And I wanted to try to show people on the left that they make a profound mistake in in rejecting the idea of patriotism. Uh, there is no, you, you can't have a country, you can't have a viable, you can't have a sustainable country without, you know, a, a kind of patriotism. Especially, this is especially, I think, true of democracies, which require public legitimacy in the form of patriotism. And what we have seen, especially on the kind of woke left, is that just a dismantling, a uh, kind of systematic dismantling. You mentioned George Washington. I mean, if you can't get behind George Washington, or if you can't get behind Abraham Lincoln, uh, who else is there? I, I, I want to say, you know, there are, you know, many admirable people. But if you can't do, if you can't get behind, if you can't get behind Lincoln, there's something has gone profoundly wrong. Well, and it, it's interesting because you know of the two sort of extreme spheres that you talk about. On the right, on the radical right, there's no such thing as a person who is too bad, right? Like there's no bottom. Right. Um, and on the extreme left, there's this expectation of perfection, which doesn't exist in humanity. Mm -hmm. It's and, exactly yeah. That's that's exactly right. I would would agree with that. This search for um, a, a kind of, especially on, on the left, I think you, you find this search for uh, this kind of, the, a kind of moral idealism, which has been, which is pushed out. I mean, po history, history and politics is complicated. There are no, I mean, there are good people, de definitely. But even, even there, uh, we, we are fallible. Uh, we are we are fallible. People make mistakes. They do the wrong thing, uh, and there's a sense of history. Okay, you you could you could push back against Washington. He was a slave owner. Well, they had slaves then. What could he, you know? That's the world he that's the world he lived in. That's the world he had. Uh, can, we have to accept we have to accept certain things from the past. That sounds like common sense. I think it is, but especially this kind of. Um, this kind of what you call perfectionism, this search for perfectionism is something that uh, is killing uh, our, our sense of, of, of what a decent patriotism is because nothing can live up to it. Well, you know, it's interesting, um, I guess 18 months or so ago now, uh, we as an organization um, produced an ad, we produce a lot of ads um, featuring then candidate Biden, vice president, former vice president Biden. Um, and it was, you know, very patriotic. Mm -hmm. um, well, in, 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 let me say this, in the, in the taxonomy of Republican voters, mm -hmm. he was very patriotic. He's saluting soldiers, mm -hmm. there's eagles, there's fighters, you know, fighter jets flying over him, you know, you know, trooping the color, you know, looking at the, looking at the soldiers, the Marines. And Rick Wilson, who runs our creative shop, said he got a call from a Democratic consultant said, that's a great ad. We could never make that. Mm -hmm. And and so again, we're we're former Republicans, right? We're not we're we're all independents. We have we have a couple of prominent Democrats, but Rick and Stuart and me were or, or I we're all we're all former Republicans, but we still understand that. And that was one thing I thought uh, Stephen was interesting in last week, which is, um, you know, the there is no play. I mean, the the progressive left and the moderate left have. People, you know, they have the squad, they have President Biden, whoever it is they have, and the radical right have Trump and all the stuff that comes with them. But the center right of the country is pretty much politically homeless at this point. They don't have anybody they want to look at. They don't want to. They don't really have anybody they want to hear from. And 
and maybe most surprising and troubling, they don't have anybody talking to them either. Mm -hmm. um, they're just sort of, and, and they make up a whole heck of a lot of voters uh, come this November. Um, and so it, it's interesting as the, to see, and maybe, maybe that's true of the moderate left too. Maybe I'm overlooking them. Um, and maybe this has been a problem all the time, right? Voters say, oh, I want everybody to work together. Um, but the loudest voices in the, in the room always get heard, um, regardless of whether or not they're yelling patriot or they're, you're, you know, they're yelling fire in a crowded theater. So explain to us in your book um, how you see where, I, I, I think we could all agree there's myriad ways we got here, but how do you see us talking about patriotism in this time, admitting that you wrote the book even before January 6th? Right. Uh, let me just say one one thing about the way you you introduced that thought, going back to uh, President Biden's uh, the, the description of him and the, the, the uses of, of patriotic symbolism uh, for a number of reasons, seem obvious, but in some ways, you know, the language of patriotism comes easier to those on the conservative side of the spectrum than right. the liberal than the liberal side. Uh, so it is, it does seem uh, in many ways sort of surprising when a liberal, uh, even a progressive-ish liberal like like Biden endorses or somehow embraces the, lang the language of patriotism. I, I think it's something that no, no politician can afford to completely do without at all. But early in the first few days of the, the administration, and I don't want to get into, you know, where the administration's gone after a year and so on, things that I dislike about it, and some things that I think have done, been well, done well. But I wrote, I wrote an op-ed, an, an online piece uh, fairly early on saying that Joe Biden needs a sister soldier, sister soldier moment, mm -hmm. uh, recalling the time when I think then candidate Bill Clinton took right. to ask a hot, prominent rap singer of the time, Sister Soldier, who had made a kind of racist statement about, about, about whites, about blacks and whites, and Clinton called her out. And I thought Biden should have done that. I mean, and, and there's, it's, it's, it's a, as the, they say in the military, it's a target rich environment. Uh, the thing that, when I wrote that was come to my attention was the attempt kind of of the uh, San Francisco school board to take the name of, Lin again, the names of Lincoln and Washington, I think, off of San Francisco schools. I mean, right. this, this is insane. Uh, now, as the president, he doesn't have the authority to overstep, you know, the inanities of local school boards, but he still has the he still has the authority to call this out for what it is. And it has been something of a disappointment to me that he has not done more than he has to kind of call out uh, the woke left uh, in, his, uh, in, his own, in his own party. Because that would do a lot to reassure people of the, the kind of what I think of as the, the broad center of the country, the center left and the center right, things that a lot of people still still believe in, that that he is aware or he is attuned to, to their concerns because that that those concerns are are real. Uh, the book was written uh, to, in a way, speak to those people uh, on the left who maybe have forgotten what the language of patriotism sounds like and are perhaps embarrassed by it. And those on the right who are embarrassed in their own way by the extremism to which their own movement has gone in, in embracing a kind of violent nationalism. And the book was an attempt to bring the language of patriotism back to, in a way, the decent center of our country that I think is characteristic of Republicans and Democrats of, of good faith on, on both sides. And I think there are some. There may, they may not be in Washington, but uh, there certainly are uh, decent people who I think are looking to want to reclaim that language and how to, how to think of our country in a more affirmative way. Yeah, and, and I would say this is that, you know, 
the true, I mean, in this moment today, and the reason why the Lincoln Project does what we do, um, and that is take on Republican candidates, is because we only have one pro democracy party left in in my mind, which is the Democ- the big D Democratic Party, for all of its other foibles. Um, and I think you know, getting back to what we saw last week, which is when you have the chair, the national leader of the party, getting back to where we started, talk, you know, a legitimizing right in, in the use, use of the word legitimate violence um look we've been you know we have this saying here Stephen, at the lincoln project is we're sick of being right um you know i'm not a democrat for various reasons and and some of the times the things they say and do make me crazy but the truth is is that like when i go to bed at night i don't worry about joe biden being president of the united states i don't worry about kamala harris being vice president of the united states I, I know that when I wake up in the morning, you know, these are folks who I believe are dedicated to doing the best they can for the United States. But talk to me about Lincoln in your book, because he, you know, 1860, um, you know, just a, a couple of weeks from now, will be the 162nd anniversary of his Right Makes Might speech mm-hmm. um, at the Cooper Union, which really launched his candidacy in 1860. But give us a sense, because he obviously dealt with a with a split of extremes that, you know, literally split the country and cost hundreds of thousands of American lives in the process. So talk to me a little bit about how Lincoln figures into your thinking. Thanks for asking me that. Uh, Lincoln has been uh, a hero of mine for, uh, I wouldn't say as long as I can remember, but a long time at any rate. I I teach a course on on Lincoln here at Yale. Mm -hmm. And uh, in many ways, my interest in Lincoln is sort of uh, is is connect certainly connected with my uh, decision to to write the book that I did. And Lincoln is, uh, in many ways, the hero hero of the book. Um, the uh, passage or the description that you quoted from the New York Times this past weekend about enlightened patriotism uh, that is one of the chapters of the book, Enlightened Patriotism. And part of that chapter, a good part of it, is devoted to Lincoln and how, how Lincoln understood America. What were his, how did he understand it? And I, I argued in the chapter, there are three principles of Lincolnian patriotism that I think we should always keep in mind as a kind of pole star almost for, for our thinking on this. Uh, first of all, Lincoln was a kind of egalitarian. He continually went back to the Declaration of Independence, and what was important for him was its equality cause, that all men are created equal. There is a kind of moral dignity to every human being and every individual, whatever their status, whatever their birth, whatever their color or place of origin. He deeply believed in equal equal human dignity, something that we've sort of lost the sense of, too. Um, Lincoln's patriotism was also inclusive. Uh, He didn't draw lines between us and them. That was very foreign to his way of thinking. There's an early speech he gives, a relatively early speech, uh, his first big speech about slavery. And he says uh, about people, about his enemies or people in the South, he says, we would be just what they are if we were in their position. There's, there's, There's a capacity to understand people on the other side that made his patriotism inclusive. It wasn't about f- drawing lines between friends and enemies and demonizing demonizing your opponents. He tried to find common basis in, in, in inclusion. And, and his patriotism was, was also progressive. And, and I don't mean that in the modern sense of being a progressive or the contemporary sense of being a progressive. He understood that we weren't necessarily where we wanted to be. Maybe another word for it would be aspirational. Mm-hmm. So our patriotism is an ideal, something our, our country is an ideal, something we aspired to. Uh, we weren't necessarily there. We weren't perfect, but we were making progress in, the, in that direction. So that's why I say it was kind of, it was kind of small p progressive or or aspirate maybe putting it another way as aspirational it wasn't my country right or wrong it was my country as we as we think it can be uh, that that's not to fall down the path of the kind of perfectionism that we were talking about earlier it would never be perfect enough 
but we he did see he did see America as an idea, as an ideal. Um, but, but but let me ask you this, because you know the the discussion of understanding you know where someone else sits in the world, um, he may have had that understanding, but it certainly didn't stop him from believing that that worldview was wrong. Um, and it certainly didn't stop him from waging a war against what he considered an insurrection, right? right? He, didn't, he did not see the Confederate States of America as a sovereign nation. He saw it as southern states, slave states, the Confederacy, as we would call it, in revolt, right. in, in open revolt. So how do you square the idea of being progressive, seeing the world through other people's eyes, but also still saying, but there is a moral judgment to be made, oh, and I'm going to have to make it. Absolutely. I mean, he did. He did believe that, and I, I didn't. And I think a conviction about the moral rightness of equality and of the Declaration was was central. Was central to him. But you, you know, in many ways, unlike the uh, uh, Utah Republicans that you were referring to, either he he believed that he believed at some level. He thought we could reason about our differences. Now, it's important to remember, uh, it was South Carolina that fired on the American flag. Uh, right. The first time, and uh, it, the first time in American history that Americans had fired on the American flag. That was, it's an extraordinary thing when you think about it. And I know there are a lot today, especially, you know, in the South, they want to believe that, uh, you know, they were fighting to maintain their way of life against big government, against intrusion. But no, uh, they were unhappy, I'd be making some comparisons to 2020, perhaps. Uh, they were unhappy with the result of a what we call a free and fair election. And they were prepared to use violence, in this case, firing on the American flag and on, and on Union soldiers. They were to do that, to if not to overturn it, at least to to disrupt and to uh, to to rebel against it. Uh, it's, a, it's a sobering reflection, thinking about our own our own moment. And Lincoln, Lincoln responded to that with toughness and with conviction. But uh, it's it's interesting because you know uh, somebody else brought this up not too long ago that. It was precisely because the Southern states accepted that Lincoln had won the White House that they took the action they did, <laughs> right? Um, they didn't dispute that he'd won. They just said, if he wins, we're out of here. That's that's true. Uh, there was no big lie of that that period. They that that's right. They did accept the legitimacy of the outcome, but just said that's that's not what we want. And Lincoln gives a remarkable gives a remarkable message to Congress and says, if you, uh, if you accept their logic, uh, there can only be two alternatives, either despotism or anarchy. Because if you, do, if you reject the logic of elections and of free government, uh, you will either have only despotic government or you will have anarchy. And Lincoln, Lincoln brilliantly, you know, he, he saw the he always saw every occasion, every speech in his way was a kind of uh, occasion for teaching. It was an occasion for educating American, the American people about what, what a republic or by that time, what a democracy, what a democracy is. Right. And that, that's something we have lost too, the, the kind of educational uh, aspect of patriotism. That's one of the things I talk about, especially in the last chapter. People aren't born patriots. Uh, it's not something you, you get in your DNA. Uh, it's something you have to be taught. Uh, it's a function or it's an expression of what what, and how we, we have been taught. And that's, that's what we are losing, I, I fear, a great deal, both not only in universities, but in high schools and in elementary schools. The, our, our sense of what our history is, of course, we fight continually over what the history is. But, uh, right. We, but, we, we it, have it, lost it, a sense of, of, of a kind of decent uh, appreciation of American history. Right. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, we see, I think, 
the, the, a lot of the Republican Party has a very ugly streak of white nationalism at this point. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think about this in the context, Stephen, of, of the Olympics going on right now, which is, you know, you think about um, France is full of the French. Italy is full of Italians. Germany is full of Germans. China is full of Chinese. J Japan is full of Japanese. America is full of Americans, right? If you look at the if you look at the U.S. Olympic teams, they are the world knitted together, right? In in one place, you know, we we used to call it the Great Melting Pot, but I think it is that it has been that idea to your point uh, of of Lincoln seeing America as as an ideal. We call it the Great Experiment, right? We've talked about the American Dream, which is too far out of reach for for too many, certainly. Um, and I think that is the, the, the source of our strength. And, and I know that we at the Lincoln Project believe that that will continue to be the source of our strength because I do believe that there are more Americans who either latently, you know, want to believe it, do believe it, but don't know what to do, um, than the people who believe, you know, it's, it's you know, it, white national, you know, being American means being a white Christian male, probably. Uh, and, you know, and being able to do whatever you feel like doing. And so I think that to your point about Lincoln, it's easy to get sucked into the vortex of ugliness and meanness because we see it all around us. Uh, but I don't think that we can or should ever forget why it is that so many of us do this, whether or not it's the, it's the books you write and the classes you teach or the work that we do, because all of this has to be for something greater than making, you know, pithy television ads or teaching a 52 minute lecture three days a week. It has to be that, you know, America is bigger than all of us. And I think that for the folks out there, I hope that you believe that. And I hope that's why you watch. Um, Stephen, I want to say thank you uh, for joining me today. Um, everybody, I want to just take one quick minute um, and talk about what we saw last week. And not to overstate it, but, um, you know, I, I grew up in, in the building where the Republican National Committee is housed. Um, other people went to summer camp and I went to my dad's office. Uh, that is the Dwight Eisenhower National Republican Center that has pictures of Reagan and Lincoln, Grant, Nixon, George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, Eisenhower, all of them on the walls. And they should take all those pictures down because if there's Republicans in name only in this country now, it's the people who occupy that building it's the people like Ron and McDaniel who now espouse that violence is legitimate discourse and people like Donald Trump who open the doors to these things. The people like Steve Bannon and Dan Bongino and Glenn Beck and Tim Poole and all these other folks who continue to fire up that not insignificant amount of our country. And guys, we must do this and we can and will do this together, right? We got nine months to go. I want you to go to jointheunion.us. That's jointheunion.us and recruit yourself and recruit your friends and family because we can do this together. As, as my favorite singer Jason Isbell says, there can't be more of them than us, and there aren't. I want to thank Stephen Smith, professor at Yale, for coming. Before we leave, we're going to show you a video that we dropped last night. Uh, it's got a lot of curse words in it, so if you've got kids at home, uh, send them out of the room or watch it later. Until then, I want to thank everybody. B, let's go ahead and roll it. If Pence cave, we're gonna drag motherfuckers through the streets. If we find out you politicians voted for it, we're gonna drag your fucking ass through the street. We're not gonna have our election, our country stolen. Because this is the second fucking revolution, and we're fucking done. That is not patriotism, gang. That is nationalism. That is ugliness. That is incitement to violence. That is the antithesis of patriotism. It is the antithesis of being an American. Stephen, thanks again for joining me. Everybody, I'll see you next week. You'll have a guest host on Friday. Get out there, do the work, gang, and we'll see you soon. My pleasure. Thank you, Reed. Thank everybody. To the